Thank you, Madam President Jenkins, uh, Council Vice President Palmasano, uh, City Council members, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Superintendent Al Bangora, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board President Forney, Commissioner Abene, Board of Estimate and Taxation President Pre Stinson, uh, and Vice President uh, Brandt, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority Executive Director Warsami, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority Board Chair Tom Hoke, our wonderful city department leaders and our extraordinary community partners. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, uh, and I appreciate your willingness to work together. This budget marks our first full two-year budget cycle. The second of any two-year budget cycle is largely geared toward following through on commitments that have already been made. That's the case here. Multi-year promises that we made back in 2022 to our constituents, to city departments, staff, council members, these commitments are kept and they will be reflected in this proposed 2024 budget. For example, last year, we promised to increase funding for our behavioral crisis response program. We have kept that promise with increased ongoing funding of nearly $3 million per year. The program is now rightfully housed within our Office of Community Safety along with our other essential safety services. BCR has indeed become a staple in our safety system. It's here to stay and we are committed to it. Last year, we also converted our violence prevention spending from temporary and one-time funding to permanent ongoing funding. In the new government structure, we have built out a neighborhood safety department and are keeping our promise to prioritize funding and violence prevention work with a $3.3 million investment. In terms of housing, we included a promise last year to maintain historic level, levels of funding in our affordable housing trust fund for a total of $18 million in 2024 to keep up production and leverage the massive state housing resources that will be coming available this year. Another promise we have kept, our anticipated levy increase for this year. Last year, we anticipated that the budget levy increase for this year would be 6.2%. That's it. No higher. We've held firm at 6.2% for the levy increase this year. Not only does this budget keep promises, it lays out generational investments in the city we love. It lays out a plan for the future. Making these investments and standing by them for the long haul will take courage, but the ideals set in this budget are more than just courageous. courageous. They're realistic. So today, as we complete our first two-year budget cycle, we sit where courage meets reality. Through this budget, we're positioning Minneapolis for progress on both courageous new work and bedrock government service. We need to do both, and we need to do both well. As I said before, this marks the second half of our first two-year budget cycle. Last year, I highlighted the importance of this shift, allowing us to effectively plan ahead. This year, I'll discuss a bit more of the process of arriving at this final proposal. First, there are some essential thank yous, starting with the city's budget team. You have no idea how hard they work. Without them and their work, this wouldn't even be possible. I don't think anyone can truly appreciate the hard work that goes on behind the scenes, starting at the very least January 1st. But we are lucky you're here and that you can do the job for the city and our residents. Thank you. And to, be and to be specific, we're talking about Chief Financial Officer Deshani Dai, Interim Budget Manager Jane Desenza, and Andrea Inouye from my office. They all deserve a special shout out here. The three of them have led this process, and thank you so much. And to my cabinet in this newly formed government restructure, uh, they have carried out some incredible leadership, and I want to thank them in full. So an early thank you to our city attorney, Kristen Anderson, to our interim city operations officer, Heather Johnston, and our community safety commissioner, Cedric Alexander. Thank you all for your service. Applause 
Second, there are a whole lot of people that we engage for this budget process each year. I meet with city council members, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board members, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority leaders, and every single department here at the city. They all provide valuable input, and it results in better decisions, no doubt about it. There are areas where council members had unanimous feedback. For example, setting aside direct funding for the legislative department at the city. So we've done that in this budget. We included investments in constituent services planning, audit and evaluation work, new legislative attorneys, data practices and records, and in the elections division. Council President Jenkins wanted intentional dollars set aside for planned and future work at George Floyd Square, including art preservation and community engagement. That's in this budget to the tune of almost $720,000. Council Vice President Palmasano pushed for a direct investment in neighborhood organizations, the heartbeat of our city. We made sure that 420,000 of new funding for neighborhoods was in this budget, increasing the Bates budget for each neighborhood across the city from 10 to 15,000. Council members Payne and Shugtai were vocal supporters of stronger climate action. We're taking our work to the next level with a $10 million investment in the Minneapolis Climate Legacy Initiative, an historic framework to electrify more Minneapolis buildings and support the next generation of a green workforce. Council Member Wansley and I agree on investing in our public housing. Council President Jenkins, MPHA, Executive Director Warsami, Board Chair Hoke and I announced last week that we're adding an historic $4 million of ongoing funding into the budget for Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, increasing our ongoing funding almost five times what it was just last year. Councilmember Rainville's brainchild, Warehouse District Live, was piloted this year to great success, where we saw the number of shootings in the downtown entertainment area drop drastically. We wanted to see this investment continue, so we're continuing the pilot with 600,000 in funding for next year. Councilmember Vita, a former park board commissioner, championed an investment in our parkways. From the north side to the south side, I agree with this, and we have included $2.7 million for parkway repairs. Councilmember Vita, by the way, also wanted investment in Turning Point, a non-profit, a nonprofit focused on substance abuse on the north side. We've included $500,000 for Turning Point. Thank you for your advocacy. Council Member Ellison has been a long-term and long-time partner in our ownership and opportunity fund work and asked for more funding for our small business, especially those that are BIPOC owned. This fund has been a catalyst for inclusive economic development across our city, and we've included another $3 million to carry that momentum forward. Councilmember Jamal Osman has been working to fight the opioid crisis within the East African community for quite some time now. He wanted to see that reflected in this budget. This year, we are putting forward almost $3 million to help address the opioid crisis citywide. The funding will be used for culturally responsive treatment facilities, new programming and staff, and a new medical mobile unit. Councilmember Goodman wants to see the recommendations from the vibrant downtown storefronts work group, which, by the way, she was a member of, come to fruition. Over $1 million in this budget for that ongoing work. We all know that success of our city overall is tied to the success that is experienced downtown. So we're investing in our downtown. Councilmember Goodman, by the way, also insisted on that proposed 6.2 levy. In fact, she uh, wanted to make sure that it stayed at 6.2%, which we also made happen. Council member Jason Chavez wanted to partner on our ongoing homelessness response. He's been a long and staunch advocate, and we have put $1 million in the budget for additional shelter capacity. Council member Koski, our budget committee chair, asked us to lay the groundwork in our capital plan for new zoned alarm systems and fire stations across the city that will improve both outcomes and firefighter wellness. We have planned for that as well. Council member Andrew Johnson wanted to lever part Lever leverage partnerships with the state and federal governments. He understands that funding our intergovernmental relations department 
could be a force multiplier and could open us up to opportunities ranging from grants to IRA funding. With our investment of $100,000 of ongoing funding, we can establish important touch points that result in more dollars coming into the city. So hopefully you see that this budget is a thoughtful and collective budget, one that includes a great amount of input and feedback from my colleagues, you all on the city council, and leaders throughout our enterprise. Thank you, thank you all for your input, it has been invaluable. And this budget is indeed one that invests in our long-term city's future. Speaking of long-term impact, let's talk consent decree and community safety. <clears throat> It's not news to anyone that Minneapolis will be entering into a federal consent decree with the Department of Justice, one that will provide a roadmap for change. Getting this right, truly accomplishing change and reform is something that I know we all want. If we all want to see change in our police department, we need to recognize that change isn't cheap. And change isn't optional. It's no longer optional as to whether we have an early intervention system or not. We need to. It'll set, we, it's no longer optional as to whether we hire, hire compliance uh, positions and use of force specialists. We have to. Indeed, the politics of these decisions should be a thing of the past. Through the consent decree, there will be a shared sense of understanding. Everyone will know what is required of us and the standard that we are collectively striving to meet. We can lay the foundation for an entirely new accountability structure, a structure where we have to produce data, and overhaul the systems that rely on that data. We will show our work and we will have an opportunity here to unite around getting this right and the change that we all want to see. Here's what it's gonna take. An investment of approximately $16 million in 2024 and nearly $11 million in 2025 and beyond. This will be a combination of ongoing and one-time funding and will go toward the implementation of this agreement, meaning the daily work of compliance. Driving this critical work for the city will be a team of at least 34 dedicated staff, including 28 civilian positions in MPD. This investment will go toward every part of the process to fundamentally change the way policing is done in Minneapolis. We will need new data systems built by our IT department, We'll need new staff positions, not only in MPD, but in civil rights and our city attorney's office. We need assessments of our current facilities. We will provide more officer wellness programs and support, and we are going to need to cover the cost of an independent monitor. Getting this right will demand every ounce of determination and commitment from this local government, and every ounce of commitment that we have across every level of leadership. The urgent met mission of reforming the MPD will not be quick, it will not be easy. And if history or learnings from other cities are any guide, we will encounter moments of great frustration together, but we will do so together. And if we all choose to stand united in this work, it's gonna be worth it. It'll be worth it when people on the street feel the change in the interactions that they have with officers. It'll be worth it when officers consistently have the support they need to do their job and do it in full, and to provide compassionate and caring public safety. <clears throat> and it will be worth it years from now when people look to Minneapolis for how to change policing in America. Not only are we charting a new course for policing, we're making important investments to improve safety wholesale in this city. That means continuing to build out our comprehensive and coordinated approach. Remember the Minneapolis Safe and Thriving Communities Report we unveiled recently? Well, we're investing in the recommendations and adding three new positions in OCS to oversee the work. This is just the start of implementing the recommendations from this report, and we are committed to continue, continuing safety innovation work, including our Safety Beyond Policing initiatives. We're adding $2 million to increase civilian positions within the Minneapolis Police Department. That means we will hire civilians to fill roles within the department that do not necessarily need to be filled by sworn officers, ensuring that our officers themselves are out on the street providing the services that they can provide and that the community needs. Another way we are innovative, innovatively using the resources we have, we're adding $1 million for portable cameras. These cameras are not only a huge deterrent for crime, 
They also allow us to work with community groups to address crime hotspots across the city. And because they are portable, we can continuously move them to where they are needed most. A few more OCS investments. As I mentioned earlier, we're doubling down on our promise to invest in violence prevention with $3.3 million ongoing funding and adding another $1.45 million for the BCR program, bringing the total ongoing funding to 2.9 annually. We're continuing to invest in our emergency management response through National Incident Management System, adding over $200,000 for continued training for our entire city leadership team. And finally, we're putting $150,000 into the fire department to update computer systems in our fire trucks, making sure they are equipped to quickly alert firefighters to priority calls. All of these investments combined will contribute to the safety and well-being of the residents in our city. But our safety work isn't just limited to the Office of Community Safety. We have departments within the Office of Public Service that work each day to keep our residents safe too. Our homeless and highly mobile residents oftentimes have difficulty assessing the services they need. So with $1 million to our health department, we're purchasing and staffing a bus. That bus can literally go to any part of the city and provide on-site services, ranging from addiction services to housing and shelter support. This bus will help better coordinate our city services, work alongside our providers at Hennepin County, and it's a bus, so it can go anywhere, meeting residents where they are at. Here at the city, we're in the business of caring for our residents. Some of our residents may have four legs. That's why we're investing $250,000 into the Minneapolis Animal Care and Control Division of Regulatory Services. We need to keep our animal shelters staffed to give our furry residents the care that they need before finding a permanent home. We're also in the business of enacting laws. Right now, we have immense changes that have been instituted by the state and that we're charged with implementing at the local level. Big thank you to the state legislature. As of August 1st, recreational cannabis is legal in Minnesota. Even before the legislation passed in May, we had organized a multi-departmental, multi-jurisdictional staff work group with many OPS departments like CPED, IGR, Health, REIB, and Arts and Cultural Affairs to work alongside the City Attorney's Office on regulations, rules, and responsibilities. The war on drugs did immense damage to people in our country, especially communities of color. We in Minneapolis will make it our priority to ensure that we have the right policies to place to help undo some of that harm. This work is important to get right. So as we row toward a January 2025 flag the state has put in the ground, we're investing $315,000 into CPED for planning, for programming, and then implementation of these upcoming cannabis regulations. From safety to public health to laws and regulations, this work we do to ensure residents have their basic needs met. Another basic need, housing. In every budget, in every state of a city address that I've been mayor for, I've talked about affordable housing. Why? Because it is that critical foundation from which people can rise, and because Minneapolis is leading the way nationally. You've heard me talk about the record amounts of affordable housing production that we've put up. You've heard me talk about the record amounts of naturally occurring affordable housing that we're able to protect, which is leading to more and more residents getting into safe and stable and permanent housing. It's true. You've also heard me talk about how increased supply under the 2040 plan has kept rents down, indeed, almost more than any other city nationally. That's also true, and you can check out the Pew Research and data for yourself. And according to Bloomberg just this last week, this intentional investment in supply and production has led to Minneapolis effectively managing inflation rates better than anywhere else in the country. But one aspect of affordable housing that is in desperate need of improvement and expansion is our public housing stock. 
Decades of disinvestment from the federal government, going back to the Reagan administration, has left public housing agencies across the country scrambling to do more with less, do more for the thousands of residents on waiting lists, do more to help with substantial backlog of maintenance. At some point, you can't do more with less. Cities should not be in the position where they have to fund public housing to the tune of millions of dollars. This is a national issue, one that begs the question of why there hasn't been more funding at the federal level. But when people need homes, public homes, somebody needs to step up and take action. We are because it's the right thing to do. We are increasing our ongoing investment in public housing from $1 million to $5 million total annually for preservation and for production. This is five times more than the previous funding level. I don't say this lightly, this is historic. It won't just be that $5 million that we're providing on an ongoing basis. It'll also be the tens of millions more that the MPHA will now be able to leverage. And we're not just investing these millions of dollars into our public housing. We're investing time and additional resources. This funding agreed upon with MPHA leadership will place a newfound focus on P MPHA resident security in and around the agency's 42 high rises. We'll have MPD establish direct lines of communication with MPHA's security team and commit to regular meetings with them, their residents to answer questions and field any concerns. Our historic investments won't be enough on their own. We need all levels of government investing in public housing to sustain our housing stock for generations to come. That's why we established the Public Housing Preservation and Expansion Convening, a group of private partners and local, regional, and state and federal offices who are all focused on finding new strategies to preserve and expand public and deeply affordable housing in this city. I'm proud that Minneapolis is leading on this work and I hope that others will follow suit and follow our lead. Another area where Minneapolis is leading the way, climate action. It's no secret, climate change is affecting every corner of our world. From the Southwest to Maui, you've seen how heat can contribute to disaster, tragedy, and inhabitable places. And the summer we're experiencing right now could very well be the coolest one we will experience for the rest of our lives. Think about that. This should raise alarms for everyone, no matter your political affiliation. And this isn't a new issue either. We know temperatures are rising, greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, and little by little, we're seeing natural disasters impact more and more communities around the world. In fact, research shows one third of Americans currently live under extreme heat advisories. So right now, we must think of ourselves not only as mayors and council members and advocates of the residents that we have today, but as the mayors, council members, and advocates of those that are not here yet. This is about our collective future and about acting to protect it. The newly announced, in fact, just last month, Minneapolis Climate Legacy Initiative is an innovative way to achieve our city's accelerated equitable climate action goals. Through this initiative, I'm adding an additional $10 million into climate action work each year, starting with this budget. This new $10 million triples our investment in climate work, broadening the scale and scope of what can be done. Here's specifically where the funding is going. Through $4.7 through million, we will start our journey of weatherizing all homes in Minneapolis, first prioritizing those in our green zones, our goal is to eventually ensure every home in our city is weatherized. Weatherizing homes and making our city more sustainable requires a skilled local workforce. It necessitates a deep relationship with labor and trades to help with recruitment, community education, certified trainings, internships, opportunities, and then ultimately job placement. So we're investing $1.4 million to get the job done. When money becomes available from the federal government, we will set ourselves apart by having the trained union workforce to receive the money and to get the work. But we're not stopping there. With $850,000 for our Climate Legacy Initiative, we will increase the number of trees offered in our annual residential tree sale, once again prioritizing green zones. Together with community partners, we will be planting four times the number of trees on private property than property than we did just a few years ago. Is it a big plan? Sure. 
but it's one we're committed to and one that we're ready for. And I'll tell you this, Minneapolis will lead the nation in this climate action work and the Climate Legacy Initiative will help us do it. And there's nothing that makes you think of the climate more than being outside in a park. Minneapolis has a unique relationship with the Minneapolis Park and Re Recreation Board. This independent body is a big reason why we have a nation leading park system over a hundred years after its inception. However, this independent body also results in a uh, confusion sometimes given the dynamic. Because Minneapolis residents don't care whose jurisdiction a parkway is, they just want it fixed. They don't care who cuts the grass, they just want it cut. And they don't care who keeps the lakes clean, they just want to enjoy them. This has been made exceedingly clear by both the superintendent, the president, and a number of commissioners on the park board itself. Two years ago, we stepped up to deliver a long-term sustainable funding program for youth programming in our parks. Six years ago, we stepped up to provide long-term capital for our parks, and today again, we're stepping up to find a sustainable solution to improve our parkways and the most vital natural assets that our city has become known for, our lakes, our creeks, and our river. Potholes, specifically on St. Anthony Parkway, and through so many parkways throughout the city, uh, they got bad this year. Did you drive around the Lake of the Isles this spring? It was rough. I think we can all agree that our parkways and all roads can use some TLC. Remember that winter we had with record-setting snowfall? It was this last one. It was so bad that so far this year, Public Works has needed to fill 8,000 potholes citywide. Let's put that in context to what it means. It's the same number of potholes that we filled in the previous three years combined. 8,000 potholes over three years, and then 8,000 potholes in the first seven or so months of this year. And by the way, we're not to December yet. So we'll step up for the city and for our public works department for our parks and for our parkways. That means we're investing in our long-term street health, ramping up from $750,000 to $2.7 million in ongoing funding for our park board and their parkways. And we're investing $70 million in all other streets throughout the city. There's another important aspect we all know and love in our parks. We're the city of lakes, after all. We're including an increase of $500,000 annually via our stormwater fee to help analyze our park board's stormwater infrastructure. This will help inform future budget decisions for the health and the safety of our public waters. And that's where we find ourselves now, making both future projections and current year budget decisions, decisions that are courageous and realistic. The decisions that you've heard mentioned in this speech are by no means the full extent of this budget process. There's a whole binder full of them. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that we are setting the tone collectively for the direction that we're going. To all the department heads that have had heavy influence on this budget, thank you for your contributions, not just to this budget, but to every single day and the operations in this city. Please thank your city staff as well. They are incredible. And And so we're here today uh, where courage meets reality, where innovation, bold action meets necessity. In my State of the City address, I said our city is in a state of rebound. We are, and we've had an incredible summer so far to prove it. Record crowds for Pride Weekend and Taylor Swift. The Taste of Minnesota and Black Business Week were huge hits. Violent crime is down, and we are the first city in the country to tackle inflation. By the way, we're increasing the funding for Black Business Week next year by $70,000 to $100,000 in ongoing funding. That is just one example of some of the areas that we did not cite during this budget speech, but people will benefit. I think it's pretty clear that we're in a state of rebound but we're also in a state of transition as we roll away from crisis mode and we begin to plan for the realities of our future. For the most significant items in this budget, I'm hopeful we can achieve a sense of unity. 
investments to meet a soon-to-come federal consent decree are not optional. Somebody has to step up with pub for public housing, deferred maintenance, and new unit production. Somebody also has to step up to address the climate crisis. And in Minneapolis, a world-class park system is not seen as a nice-to-have, but as an essential part of our identity. Those somebodies that will rise up to meet the moment, they are right here in our city. Many are right here in this room, and we will step up. So let's find unity where it exists, and it does. And let's agree to agree on these long-term generational investments. To our incredible department heads and city staff, thank you for doing this honorable work for the city of Minneapolis. To council members, thank you for your input and partnership in creating this budget. And to the people of Minneapolis, thank you for loving our city. These investments, this budget is for you. For those of you who call Minneapolis home today and for those who will call it home years from now, thank you, thank you, thank you. Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, uh, the mayor has submitted his 2024 recommended budget to us, which is now the business before this body. Uh, as chair of this body, I'll recognize our budget chair, Councilmember Koski, for a motion to refer this matter to the Budget Committee. Thank you, Madam President. I move to refer the mayor's recommended 2024 budget to the Budget Committee for its review and consideration. Thank you, Councilmember Koski. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That carries, and the mayor's, the mayor's recommended 2024 budget is referred to the Budget Committee. Councilmember Koski, I recognize you to provide a brief update on the process going forward at this point. Thank you again, Madam President. The Budget Committee will take up consideration of the Mayor's recommended 2024 budget on September 11th, starting at 11 a.m., at which time our finance team will be providing a high-level overview of the proposed budget. We anticipate starting departmental hearings the same day in the afternoon, September 11th at 1.30. Department hearings and budget presentations will continue through the end of October. As usual, we have planned a total of three public hearings on the budget. The first will be held at an adjourned meeting of the City Council on Wednesday, October 25th at 6.05 p.m. Following that, the Budget Committee will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, November 1st at 10 a.m. We anticipate budget markup at the Budget Committee will begin on November 30th at 10 a.m. and continue the next day to December 1st, also at 10 a.m. At that time, the Committee will make its final recommendation on the budget as amended and forward it to the City Council for its third and final public hearing on Tuesday, December 5th at 6.05 p.m. This hearing will be the required truth in taxation hearing and will be followed by a formal vote and adoption of the budget that same night. A full calendar with all these dates and times has been posted in LIMS uh, for a public access and has been added to the council member calendars. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koski. And again, thank you, Mayor Fry. Um, for this budget that uh, reflects many of the, um, the ideas and the hopes of our community as expressed through um, our city council members. And um, we appreciate your leadership and we look forward to getting into the details of this proposed budget. Thank you, sir. 